ever wondered what it's like and what it takes to make it to the top in sport as a child? This is Barney's journey. He's from Thongbridge. He's attended local schools. Uh, he's a, a real reminder, therefore, for any of our younger listeners of exactly what you can become and what you can achieve with some real hard work and dedication. Uh, because he's a local boy. He's without a doubt one of our most promising young talents that we're proud to have come through the Thongsbridge coaching programme. And if you're looking inside the clubhouse, there's already a huge list of his outstanding achievements that he's racked up over his early years. So without further ado, I'm, I'm really proud to welcome to the forum um, Barney Fitzpatrick. So morning, Barney. Morning, you okay? Yeah, good to see you. Good to have a, have you with us and fit you in. Uh, fit us in with your busy schedule this morning. No doubt you're hitting the tennis court later. Yeah, maybe. Hopefully, I'll be down there later. Yeah, uh, the life of a full time tennis professional. I think to start off with, um, let's go right back to the beginning and, and and talk us through where it all began, how you how you got into into tennis in the first place. Because despite being so young, you've already experienced so many different things within the game so it'd be great to hear right from the start how you got into tennis yeah definitely well firstly thank you um but yeah um how I got into tennis was as you all probably know my dad my dad's a coach at Thongsbridge um so since I was four I'd say um he got me into tennis so I probably had my first lesson when I was four and then ever since that I'm pretty sure I just I just loved that. I just loved it all. I was only playing once or twice a week until I was probably seven or eight. So I was only doing it for fun, really, um, at that age. And I was also playing football, golf, which I think is really important because if you just play one sport, you might you might get burnt out. And I I love playing I love playing the other sports, but I always knew tennis tennis was my favorite, and I loved it so much. And then when I when I got around seven or eight, I'm, I kind of chose that I just wanted to play tennis a lot more. So I had to stop playing football, which didn't make me too happy, but I knew I knew it would be best for me so I could play tennis more and do what I love more. And then, yeah, when I was eight, I started playing a lot more, doing a lot more groups. And then went to a few local competitions, just in mini red, sponge ball, just locally. And that's really how I got into it. Just everyone down at Thongsbridge really, really helped me get into it. I love all the coaches. They're all so nice and they helped me loads. And just the atmosphere and being being around there was, was brilliant. So that's that's how I got into tennis. I guess for you, the, the initial starting point at, at a club where obviously your dad worked as well was perfect, perfect surrounding and environment for you to kind of nurture your tennis tennis journey. Yeah, it was perfect because we live just five minutes away and having my dad there to slowly get me into it, not rush anything. It, it was perfect. Everything everything was good. My school was close, so it wasn't much travelling. And yeah, it was sort of the perfect scenario to get started. But I'm sure the people who are watching, it's the same for you. You probably live locally and it's Dongsbridge is a great place to get started. And then coming out of, of, of Mini Red... Obviously, for you, this was where things really started to, to hit new heights. Talk us through that. Yeah, so when I went into Orange Ball, um, I was, I wouldn't say I was one of the best or anything. Um, I was still just getting to grips. People at Thongsbridge were better than me. There was Finn Merger and a guy called Jake Young and Matisse Ross, who were all, all probably, I'd say they were better than me. They're a little bit older, but they're always always a lot better than me. But I just kept I just kept at it, kept playing, and then I started to do well, and I got recognised a little bit. And then I got a wild card into the under nine grade one um, at the NCC, not expecting to do well or anything. Uh, I went there, I got through my box matches, just um, was really nervous in every match because it was my first kind of big tournament at the NTC as well it was my first time there I got through the box stages and then it went straight to the semi-finals because the winners of both boxes played the semis um, and in the semi-final I saved match points there and went on to win that match and then the final 
I also won the final, which was which was amazing. I could I couldn't believe it, and I don't think my parents could believe it either. It just came out of nowhere, and that's what really really started everything off, which which helps a lot because the LTA started to notice me and I got a lot more training and started to take it more seriously tennis yeah I mean that that obviously at such an early age was such a, an incredible achievement really yeah um obviously for those people that aren't aware mini orange is, is played on a slightly reduced size court so it's a step up from the small sponge ball tennis courts that we we start young children on and then we go on to the to the orange ball with a slightly decompressed ball as well moving out of that age group you then transition into the under 10s where you you suddenly find yourself on a huge tennis court full size but with still a slightly lower compression tennis ball so mini green we call it uh, how, how did that go um well to be honest with you all it, it didn't go very well so my last tournament in under nine was brilliant I was pretty happy with it and then when I moved into t- under 10s I, I found it so hard I didn't do well at all this year. Um, everyone was beating me and I found it really hard just the transition from the smaller court to a much bigger court was hard because um, I was playing against people who were just just moonballing, making every single ball, um, which was, which was, I found really hard to play against. I just got impatient and started to miss. And them guys, them guys who did make a lot of balls and didn't do much, uh, probably nowhere now because that's not going to get you anywhere really if you're playing if you're playing like that. Um, I mean, you might win a few a few good tournaments when you're that age, but in the future, it's not going to help you. And I'd say that's where my dad and the other coaches at Thongsbridge really helped me, um, just to keep not being so outcome orientated, more just focusing on how I want to be in the future um, and just trying to improve every day rather than trying to win this tournament at this age when it when it doesn't matter. Um, so, yeah, that definitely helped me. And also when I was in under 10s, my, my attitude sometimes wasn't great. And my, my, my dad really made me notice that and um, destroyed me if, I, if it was bad. Um, and that definitely helped. After that, learning to have a good attitude and to work hard every day, that's the best thing. And just it's easier for you. And then it's also easier for the coach coaching you. I mean, you'll get so much more out of every session and every match you play will be a lot better. So, yeah, that was that was number 10s. I think that's, you know, so many really good points in there that that some of our listeners can take on board because people often see a figure like like yourself that's reached some really good high points in the game already and think that it's, it's just a smooth transition to becoming an excellent tennis player. And it's really interesting to hear that actually, even from someone like yourself that's achieved great things already, uh, it, that's not always the case. And there's a, there's a lot of tough moments in there where you just have to keep, you know, sticking to your goals and and working hard to achieve that eventual uh, long term goal. Yeah, definitely, hundred percent. Just stick at sticking at it was was key. So moving out of of under tens, you you then hit under twelves, and I think. It's fair to say, and, and people can probably see the pictures on there, that, that you then stepped up a level and, and you started to really come into your own. Yeah, in in um, under 12s, it was, it was a good couple of years. I was In under 10s, I was so keen just to get out of under 10s and play play a proper tennis with a proper ball because when I was at Thongsbridge then, there was a lot of older players like Andy Atkinson and Holly Horsfall who were who were always older than me and I thought they were amazing and I just wanted to play with them and train with them. So I moved a little bit early to under 12s and I, f- I found it tough, obviously, at the start, like, like everyone does, because the ball's the ball's way different. And then my first grade two I played, I think I was 11. It was at Gosling. Um, I went with my dad. I played qualifying. I was so nervous before it because there was a younger guy there and he was pretty good. Uh, but I managed to beat him and get through qualifying. And then I went on to win the, ho- the, the whole grade two, which was, I have no idea how I did it. Um, in the final, I played a guy who wins every single grade two. Uh, and then I, m- I managed to beat him. So that really, really kick-started things in under 12s. And then it was just after that tournament, I got called up to play my first ever GB event, which was in uh, Belgium. 
um, which was amazing. I remember the day, the day they sent me the Team GB kit to my house. It was it was the best feeling ever. I tried it on for hours on end that night, and then the next day I flew to flew to Belgium with the team and had a, had a really good week. I was unbeaten. I didn't lose a match, uh, which was good. I played really well, uh, and that, I think that showed that I was was improving and getting there. And then a couple of weeks after, there was another GB event in in London somewhere. I can't remember where, uh, which I didn't do as well in, but it was it was amazing again to play to play in under twelves uh, in for GB again. Sorry. And then after that, I went on to win, I think, three more grade twos uh, in under 12s. And then I finished the year first in Great Britain, which was which was a good feeling for sure. Yeah, that's 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 superb. And I think something that, that you know, I don't know whether you can kind of uh, give us your opinion on, but but so many young young tennis players wanting to emulate what you've done um, in your journey so far they become really disheartened if they ever don't get selected for something like Great Britain. Um, and obviously it's a huge achievement to, to reach that milestone. But, you know, where does your opinion sit on, on where that's stood you long term? You know, is it the be all and end all for a, for a young tennis player looking at that? For me, I mean, at the time I thought it was, I thought it was amazing. But now when I look back at it, it's... It's obviously a really, really good memory, and you'll you'll always um, remember it. But it really doesn't mean anything. I know hundreds of players who, when they were nine to sixteen, were were nowhere. Even nine to eighteen, some players were not doing well. And for example, Paul Jubb, he was um, always a pretty pretty decent player, but never never one of the top players. And then he went to America when he was seventeen. And now he's doing great. I think he's around 400 in the world. Um, got really good sponsors, healthy and, and doing well. And he's really doing well for himself. And I think I think he'll make it. But he, he never have had any of that when he was younger, playing for GB or doing really well. So it really doesn't matter if if you're playing for GB or not, if you're playing for Yorkshire or not, you, can, you always have time. Again, really good message for for any of our young aspiring listeners. You know, it's not it's not all about that one experience that that can eventually make you a really successful tennis player. So from there, obviously, we we look at our screen and see more images of you on on tour with Team GB, and you progress then into the under 14s age group, where I guess things start to get a little bit more serious in the tennis world, and and it looks like you continue to be really successful in that age group. Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, when you go from under 12s to under 14s, uh, it's, it's really tough because at that age, when people are 14, everyone kind of grows a lot more and gets a bit stronger. So when you're 12 going into 14, the first the first year or so is really, really hard. I don't really think I did much in that year, apart from do fairly decent in a few in a few tournaments. But yeah, in under 14s, I achieved a lot. A few of the achievements were Winter Cup in for GB in Turkey. And then there was also a GB trip to Greece. And then the next one I did was my first Tennis Europe win, which was in Scotland, uh, which I think Paul's got a, a video of. I think this was me in the final. Yes, there we go. Closing out a good point here, Barney. First game of this match, I hit four aces in a row. <laughs> Yeah, uh, just looking pretty clinical there at the net. I like yeah. it. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so yeah, I went on to win that tournament. Um, and then at the end of under 14s, I was ranked 38 in Europe, which was a pretty good feeling because I, I didn't play so many tournaments. And I remember my last tournament was in Barcelona. It was a grade one. Um, I won my first few rounds. And then I got to the quarterfinals and then played number four in in Europe. I, I didn't think I was going to win, um, but then it turned out to be an amazing match. I won 7-6, seven, 6-7, six, six, seven, and then 7-5 in the third. It, it felt so good after three and a half hours to, to come through and win that. But then sadly, the next day in the semi-final, I, I lost because I was, I was knackered. But yeah, that was a, definitely a good one. And then going on to... 
the under 14 my last summer as a tennis player in under 14 was just it was just the best summer I've ever had and I don't think I'll forget it it was in 2016 it all started off with a team GB versus France match um and GB won won easily I won I won four out of four matches um and then the next one was GB versus USA and USA had I think two of the top five players in the world at that time. And so we were expected to win. But then again, um, I, was, I played really well and beat all four of the Americans, um, which, was, which, which felt amazing. And some of them now are doing really, really well. And then there was the biggest tournament was in um, the qualifying of the Summer Cup. So if you don't know, Summer Cup's a tournament where all the nations from around Europe um, play in a big tournament um, and then there's qualifying lots of different places. And then there's uh, the finals, which get played in Spain. Um, and in qualifying, we got to the final of qualifying and only one team gets through to the, to the finals. Um, and we were playing against Poland. I won my singles. I was playing at number two and the other lad from GB was playing at number one who lost. So it went down to the doubles and the doubles went to a third set um, and it was 15 all in the third set because it was a tie break to 10. Um, and then at 15 all, my partner hit an outrageous return down the line, which was unheard of from him. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. And then the next point, I think I hit an ace um, to win 17-15. And um, that felt great. Um, we had a big, big celebration after because we knew we had to fly straight to to Mercia in Spain to play the Summer Cup Finals, which was which was a huge achievement because not many GB teams had done that before. And then in Mercia again, we won our first two matches. I won both my matches, and then in the semi-finals we played against France, um, which had number two and four in the world um, playing. And when I played at number two, I won my match against the guy who was four in the world. I played really well. It was, I think it was 6-4, six, 6-1, six, so it was fairly comfortable, but it was a really big win. And then my friend who played at number one, he actually won the match, but I think it was 7-5, five, 5-4 five, to him, and it was 40-30 to him. Uh, he was playing a point. The guy missed. Um, but the umpire didn't call the ball out and it was, oh, it was a nightmare. There's a big, um, big argument about that. Uh, our coach went mental. Um, but in the end, he ended up losing. And then that went to the doubles and we lost the doubles 11-9 in the third set. Um, I remember after that match, I was really, really upset. Um, it got to me a lot because I knew I did everything for us to get through, but um, unfortunately we didn't. But because of that, um, because we made the semi-final, the GB journey kind of continued in that summer. Then we went straight from Spain, straight to Czech Republic, to the what's called the World Finals. So this was a competition that was not just Europe, it was every country from the world, the best ones, got into a, a huge tournament in Czech Republic in an amazing, amazing place. I mean, every court had a huge, huge stand. There's loads of fans watching Loads of people turned up, which was brilliant, but I didn't, I didn't cope very well with the nerves and I didn't do too well. And in the end, we finished eighth, um, which is not bad. So we were the eighth best country in the world at that time for tennis, um, which was a pretty big achievement. But yeah, that was, uh, that was my 14 and under summer. That, was, that I'll never forget. That was definitely one of the best. I mean, I mean that's, that's epic. I mean, what, what amazes me from just listening to your talk is the detail in which you remember each moment and, and clearly it was a really special time and, and is yeah, stayed, you know, in the memory and I'm sure it will do as you grow, grow old, you know, that, that the memories that you can't take away and it's all driven through the hard work that you put in behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, would you say some of the results at that period that were so special, cause you were really mixing it with the best next generation, if you like coming through, uh, and beating some of them, would you say that's the point at which you really started to think tennis could be a potential career? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that was probably the year where I was very serious about everything. And after this summer, I decided to go to the academy in Spain. So we pretty much made the decision that 
I want to be a tennis player and I'm going to try and pursue it as much as I can, give it my all and see how it goes. So at that age, it's pretty young, but I really, yeah, sorry, um, I really just wanted to do it and I went for it, yeah. And around about that time as well, uh, I think we've got got some images here of, of you going to the, the Junior Olympics. That was pretty yeah. special too. Yeah, that was a pretty um, pretty cool experience. It was, it was. I went to the academy, and then when I came back home for summer, I got a random a random call up um, from one of the GB coaches saying you've been selected to play at the Junior Olympics in Hungary, which was just just amazing. It was probably the best the best experience I've ever had. Just the on the slide before you saw the opening ceremony, there was I think. 20 odd thousand people that came to watch at junior olympics which i never thought would happen when we walked onto the into the stadium and everyone was everyone's clapping it was it was crazy it was it was it was a weird experience the tennis the tennis didn't go too well i lost first round to a guy who got the bronze medal so he was a decent player and i lost six four in the third so i was quite happy with how i did but obviously i wanted to do better and then at the end the tournament got finished off with a pretty one of the best parties I've ever been to, which is, I think there's a video. Does that play Paul that video? This one. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Hard to see, but it was pretty it was two thousand athletes all in one place, which is amazing. And then before we went home, we went to the Great Britain Ambassador uh, Embassy House or something, which was the picture on the left which was just a really nice, really nice house um, where we all went to eat and and drink and stuff before we flew back to England. But yeah, the the Olympics was amazing just to see all the other athletes and how good everyone was. And it was incredible just to spend a couple of weeks with some of the best athletes in the world from, from everywhere. It was, it was a really nice experience. So... You know, you're 14, you've had all these awesome experiences so far. You're starting to think, maybe, just maybe, I could become a professional tennis player. Huge decisions to be made at that at that point in your life, I guess. You know, for you and your family, you've got to now think about creating or being in the right environment to ensure that your development is maintained. Uh, what next? Where did you go? Well, the next step, it was a pretty big decision me and my family had to make. I was eager to go. I really wanted to go. Um, it all happened from a coach I saw at a grade three in England who was moving to the academy to become a coach there. So I went for a trial, loved it. It was amazing. Uh, none of it was built yet. It was just a few clay courts um, where Rafa, was, when he was a kid, used to train. And if you don't know, it's basically just a huge academy. The bit at the front of the picture is the hotel. And then the far end, there's another building where we used to stay. Um, and it's amazing. It's one of them, it's, well, it's the nicest tennis centre I've ever been to. It's, it's just absolutely brilliant. It's got everything, all the facilities you'd ever need, good weather. And I mean, one of the best things is Tony Nadal was the main coach there. Uh, he stopped working with Rafa, well, stopped touring with Rafa to become a coach there. And also, I had no idea that Rafa would be training there every day when he wasn't at tournaments. So I got lucky enough to practice with him, I think maybe 15 times, um, which was amazing. And obviously, he got a few a few good guests who I also, who I also played with. Um, and the picture Paul just showed was... Um, this was quite a good story. I was I was 14 at the time. It was um, a few days before I went to America uh, to play a tournament. And Tony watched me practice. I finished practice and then I just went to lunch um, at, the, at the cafe. Tony and a few of the coaches were sat on another table. And then when I was leaving, when I was leaving lunch, Tony shouted my name. And I, I was really scared. I thought he was going to tell me off or something. And then he said, come here, come here, come here. And then in front of all the coaches, he said, um, do you want to practice later on tonight? And I was like, um, yeah, sure. And he was like, all right. And he said, okay, Raph will be waiting on centre court for you at like 7 p.m. or something. And I, I was just in disbelief. I mean, I got so nervous. I had to wait like 
six hours because we had lunch at around 12 or one um fun it was the most nervous six hours ever but then when we when we started playing it was it was fine because I was just in the zone but it was it was the best experience best experience ever the, the first hit was amazing just because it was the first time experiencing playing with one of the best players ever and he's just such a normal guy you wouldn't even think he's the mo- one of the most famous tennis players ever and one of the richest men alive he's he's one he's really one of the most normal and humble people ever which is a really good example to everyone everyone else at the academy um for sure um but yeah that was a good story i think i think we've got some clips of you uh well in that first hit and also some of the other uh hits that you had with some of the top guys so uh, i'll just give everyone a little uh insight here we go this was one of the practices that I think a year and a half ago. I guess this is the one from the, the first hit, was it? Yeah, this was the first hit, yeah. When Rafa had a hair transplant. <laughs> this is unbelievable. I watched the ball that you're hitting against Rafa here and I, I'm sure he didn't realise what he'd taken on. <laughs> got him on the back foot there, Barney. Yeah, I was, t- I was taking him on there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, so, you know, I mean, again, unbelievable experiences and, and all at the at young age of, of just 14. And I guess things just kind of went better and better. We look at this next clip, um, another face that some of you might recognise um, that Barney was lucky enough, lucky enough to, to hit with. I was 10 times more nervous when I played with Federer than Rafa. My, leg, my legs were shaking before. It was, <laughs> it was weird. So everyone was watching and it was getting filmed and stuff. And this was just a bit when he was volleying. But yeah. <laughs> I regret not hitting a hot dog there. Everyone yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, you know, um, memories for life, I guess. I don't know whether you can just talk us through, you know, leaving home at, at 14, schooling out there. I yeah. know what it felt like when I went to university at 18. And then that first day when my parents dropped me off and left me, you know, it, it must have been hugely character building, you know, to, to have to go through that. How, how did you find that? I mean, at the time, I was quite... I'd say I was quite used to being away from home just because I was traveling loads anyway. Um, so I was pretty used to not being at home. So that definitely helped. I mean, if I, if I wasn't used to it, it would have been a huge thing, but because, because I was used to it, it was, and I was so excited when I got there, it, it, it kind of felt normal. And also <laughs> before my parents left, they didn't even say bye. Cause they just saw me. I was, I was having fun. I was with a few mates I knew there and they, they just left. They didn't want to say bye. I think that's cause they would have got, they would have got upset. Um, and they thought, right, we'll just leave them to it. But it was so welcoming there. It was, it was such a nice place. So it's obviously you miss home sometimes, but personally I, I, I didn't, I didn't really miss home. Um, but I know a lot of kids there who, who really miss home and found it hard at that age to, to be away from home. Yeah, it, it wasn't too bad. And then being at the school there, it was good. It was just one of the main reasons I went there was because at one of my last years at Thongs Bridge, I, was, I, I felt so bad for my mum because she had to take me from Thongs Bridge to Bolton one day. Well, Bolton twice a week school to Thongsbridge, school to Bolton and it was just a nightmare it was all so far away but the best thing about the academy was the school was 20 steps downstairs from your bedroom the tennis court was 
just outside your room. It was all so close. It was just the most ideal place you could you could really want to be. Um, so it, it already made it easier, but for sure it was the best four years I'll, I'll ever have. Um, just living with your friends, being every day with them, all the experiences you had, I, I'll never forget it. If anyone gets the opportunity to to go somewhere like an academy or a university, American university or anywhere, I'd 100% take it because you'll, you'll enjoy it so much and you'll create memories and friends you'll, you'll never forget. So it's definitely a, definitely a really good place to go. And, and while you were, you were out there um, at the academy, um, one of the things that you managed to, to go and do was enter the Orange Bowl, which for yeah. those that don't know is sort of the World Championships of Junior Tennis, if you like. Um, yeah. Talk us through that experience. I played my first Orange Bowls in the 12s, which was before I came to the academy. But my main one, the one where I did best in was when I was at the academy. It was just after the hit with Rafa that I just showed. I went there. The draw's massive. It's like a 128 draw. So obviously it's a lot of, a lot of rounds to win. And it's an amazing place. It's at Crandon Park. Uh, if you've ever watched Miami Open, that's where it's at. Uh, the centre court's huge. I think it's like a 30,000 seater. And I practised on there one day, which was pretty cool. But yeah, it was an, it's an amazing tournament. I think I lost in the last, the round of 16. So I won like four or five matches. Uh, and then I lost to the number one American pretty comfortably. He played, he played really well and I, I played well as well, but he was just too good. But it was a great tournament and... It's weird because at Orange Bowl, if even if you lose, you're going to everyone goes into a consolation draw. It's not just first round. So I lost in the round of 16. Then I won one consolation match, um, which gets you into like the last eight of the consolation. Um, but then there's also the eight in main draw. So I so I, and then I lost then. So I'd say I came around 14th or 15th in the tournament, which is which is not bad to say. It was all the best players in the world um, playing there, but. It's an amazing experience playing that tournament, and again, if any if anyone has the chance to play or or go there or anything, I'd I'd definitely go. I think this was this was you just just I yeah, don't know, was, was this a warm up hit, Barney? Yeah, it was before the match I lost. <laughs> yeah, he's a big guy, Barney. We put it down to his height. <laughs> Also Miami, it was in Miami and Miami is my favourite, favourite place ever. It's the best, the best place I've ever been to. And then, and then things just seem to, to keep getting better again. Um, I show everyone this, the screen with yet another amazing landmark achieved, if you like, as a junior tennis player. Yeah. Yeah. It was so when, when I came to the academy, I play, started playing ITF juniors, which is under 18. I think I was 14 or 15 when I got my first points. And then I went to Israel, uh, where I started to do really well. I made three finals. I played three weeks in Israel, made three finals, lost to the same guy in every single final, which <laughs> wasn't great. But yeah, I got good points there. I came back, played Nottingham, made semi-final and semi-final. And then somehow my ranking was around 300 at the age of 15 or 16. And then my goal was always to play junior Wimbledon uh, at some point in my junior's career. Uh, when I was 16, I went there. They asked me to go and train before junior Wimbledon, not knowing if I'd get a wild card to play. And then I signed in. Um, we waited like an hour after signing um, to see if I got the wild card. And then in the end, I did. Um, but I only played qualifying. But I got, I'd say, it's not an excuse, but I'd say I got kind of unlucky because the player I played against was ranked 12 in the world. Um, so he should have been in main draw, um, but he forgot to enter. So he got a, he got a wild card into qualifying. So yeah, that was really tough, but it was such a good experience playing on the grass there. It was, it was, it was amazing. It was perfect. I lost 6-2, 6-2, um, but it was, it was a pretty, pretty close match. Um, and getting like the Wimbledon towel and everything. It was just such a cool experience. And just being a part of Wimbledon was was pretty cool. Yeah. But how would you say you fared on the grass in terms of, you know, is that a preferred surface for you and your game? Or 
Um, for my game, yeah, it's definitely it definitely suits my game. Um, it just suited him a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> but obviously, no one trains on grass a lot, so no one's really used to it. But no, it, if I could choose a surface to, to play on, it would definitely be a hard court outside or a grass court, hundred uh, percent. Sounds amazing. Um, top of top of your game, things going really well. And then moving towards almost more recent times, things start to take a turn for the worse. Yeah. Um, well, ever since I was turned 16, I got a I um, fractured, well, I got a stress fracture in my back, in my lower back. That put me out for a really long time. And then when I when I got when I got better from my back, I, I obviously wasn't playing as well. Um, I was struggling and every every so often I um I started getting sick, went to the hospital, but then it seemed to be fine. Um, but it kept happening too often. Uh, and then recently, it was this time, it was probably today, this time last year, um, I just got really dizzy, went, went to hospital. Um, and then I got diagnosed with something called Meniere's disease, uh, which you won't, you probably won't know. Um, but it's just a problem in my ear. Um, but it's it was pretty hard the first six months of having it, but it's definitely getting better now and I'm back to training and back to, back to fitness. Not fully yet, um, but it's definitely getting there. But I just thought I'd put that picture because that's, that's my favourite picture when I was at the hospital in Spain and my best mate escaped the academy to come and, uh, to come and see how I was, <laughs> which, was which made it a lot, a, lot, a lot better. Yeah, that was a good memory, even though it's uh, bad times. <laughs> So, so getting back to full fitness is obviously a really positive thing. Um, and moving forward, um, what does the future hold for Barney then? Um, the future, my plan is to go to America. In, my goal is to go in June, whether or not I can, because of my, my illness, uh, I'm not sure. Um, but that's the goal, to go to America, start playing men's tournaments, start getting on the the world ranking, um, the ATP ranking, get my first points and just really crack on, start getting my head down and um, just giving it my all, see how it goes. Um, and hopefully things things work out, but I'm going to definitely give it my all before I before I give up and hopefully, hopefully it can do well. Well, you know, Barney... It's been an absolute pleasure for, to, to answer some of my questions. Um, you know, such a great insight into the life of, of a young tennis player coming right the way through the ranks from uh, our Thongsbridge setup to achieving already such uh, big accolades within the game. Um, it's really good for our young juniors to hear your story because you are their sort of inspiration, if you like. You're the, their role model and you are what they can become. So... You know, thank you so much for, for giving up your time to speak to us this morning. I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll look to try and wrap it up there. Um, feel free to, to obviously message Barney if, if you want to. And, and, and no doubt you might see him down at the club when we restart as well, which would be really nice. But, but I know he's always listening to anyone that wants to seek a little bit of further advice. Um, but Barney, you know, on, on behalf of the club, I'd just like to say that you are a massive inspiration to us all. It's a great journey that you've had so far, so far, and I'm sure, hopefully, it's only just beginning. Um, and you know, you are a real credit to yourself, all the hard work that you've put in, but also your parents. Um, yeah. and, and like I say, it's it's great to have you down at the club and see you around. You know, immerse ourselves with someone that's, that's operating at such a high level of the game. So thank you so much, and uh, we wish you all the best for the future. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming to watch. Great work, Barney. <laughs> Thanks.